Hey guys, so in this video we're going to start talking about angular collision. And angular collision happens when you have either um, two disks that are rotating and if you like push them against each other so that they now spin together, so that's an angular collision. Or if you have an object moving in linear motion that hits another object that will rotate. So for example, if you have a bar and let's say some object comes and hits the bar, the bar is fixed here, so the bar will rotate. Okay, that would be an angular collision problem as well. Let's check it out. So angular collision happens, um, angular collisions will happen when one of the two objects, at least one, so I should say one or more of the two objects either is rotating or rotates as a result. The problem I mentioned here, this hits, this object will rotate as a result, so this is an angular collision, okay? So there are actually three different setups of collisions. You can have a collision where two objects have linear motion, um, like for example, two boxes going towards each other. In this case, this is a linear collision, and we're gonna use, uh, this is linear collision, and we're gonna use conservation of linear momentum P to solve this problem. If you have two objects that are rotating, um, it should be obvious that this is an angular collision, a rotational collision. So the, the, the example I gave, two disks that are spinning and you push them together so they spin together. And we're going to use, this is an angular collision, we're going to use conservation of angular momentum to solve this. So the non-obvious case is if you have one V and one omega, which is the example I gave with the bar. Right, so this object moves with a V, hits the bar here, causes the bar to spin. The object has V, the bar will we'll get an omega as a result. Um, so we use this um, to solve this. This is actually an angular collision. Even though there's one of each, it's not a linear collision. It's considered an angular collision, and we're gonna solve it using the conservation of angular momentum L. You can think of it as L basically supersedes, as long as you have one omega, L will take over for P, okay? So um, this I already uh, mentioned briefly. Similar to linear collisions, we're gonna use the conservation of of momentum equation, but we're gonna use obviously the angular version, okay? That's what this is. We're gonna use conservation of L instead of conservation of P. So instead of P initial equals P final, I'm gonna write L initial equals, equals L final. Remember the conservation of momentum equation for linear momentum, if you expanded the whole equation, you would have M1 V1, M2 V2, M1 V1, M2 V2. It's the same thing here, but MV will be replaced by I omega. So it's gonna be I1 omega one initial plus I2 omega two initial equals I1 omega one final, I2 omega two final. Cool, that's the conservation um, of angular momentum equation. Now, if you have a point mass in linear motion, we're going to use the linear version of the angular momentum equation. What is this? So if you have the, um, the situation I keep uh, describing, if you have an object that collides against the bar, so you have a mass m here moving this way with the velocity v, and he hits the bar at a distance, it hits the bar right there at a distance little r from the axis of rotation, we're gonna use the equation that L equals mvr. Let me put this over here as well, L equals mvr, okay? Um, I guess it might make more sense to put this um, over the, here on the other side, so that these guys are hanging out together. Cool, L equals MVR is what we're going to use. Now what that means is that for that object, instead of using I omega, instead of using I omega, you're going to use this. So I'm gonna write here, instead. Okay, we're gonna do this, don't worry, we'll do an example. Um, now in this equation, R, as I mentioned here, R is the distance between where the linear object collides, right here, red dot, in the, the axis of the rotating object, the blue dot, right? So it's just the R vector between those two points. And the last point I wanna make here is, before we do an example, is if you have a situation where you have a rotating disc and you add mass to the disc, that is technically an angular collision problem, though we could have solved that without talking about angular collisions just by using conservation of angular momentum, okay? And the reason we could do that without worrying about uh, you know, different implications of linear collision mixed with angular collision is that these questions are simpler if the mass was at rest. So if you just add a mass in there, uh, it's a much simpler problem. Don't worry about it, we'll get there as well. All right, so here I have two disks. Um, the blue disk, if you read the whole thing here, the blue disk is spinning. Notice I have a disk of radius six and a disk of radius three. So this is the six, obviously. 
So I'm going to call this um, R1 equals 6 meters, and it has a mass of 100, so mass 1 equals 100. And then this is, I'm going to call this R2, it's 3 meters, and it has a mass M R2, M2 of 50, okay? It says here that the 100 kilograms, so the outer one, the bigger one, um, spins clockwise, clockwise looks like this, um, at 120 RPM. So I'm going to say that the RPM is... 120, 120. I'm going to call this negative 120 um, because it's clockwise, clockwise is negative, okay? And it spins around a perpendicular axis to its center. What that means is if you have a disc, perpendicular axis just means that your imaginary axis line um, runs 90 degrees to the face of the disc. So it just means that the disc is spinning like this, standard rotation for a disc, okay? A second solid disc, which is the darker one there, is carefully placed on top of the first disc um, and it causes the disc to spin together. So imagine one disc is already rotating, right? The blue disc is already rotating and then you add the, um, the gray disc on top of it and now the blue disc is essentially carrying the gray disc and they're spinning together. How, um, how do you think this is going to affect the speed, the angular speed of omega or the RPM of the blue disc. I hope you're thinking if you add some stuff on top, it's gonna to spin slower and that's what's gonna happen, okay? We're gonna have a lower RPM. So this question is asking us to find the new rate in RPM that the discs will have um, in two different situations. So first, we're gonna add a disc. We're gonna add a smaller disc here at rest, so we just lower it slowly. And in another situation, we're gonna have it where the disc on top was actually rotating in the opposite direction. So now we're gonna have a disc spinning in one way and the other disc spinning the other way, and we're gonna land the one disc into the other, okay? So let's do that. On the first one, um, we're saying that the initial omega of disc two is zero, but disc one has an initial RPM, this is RPM of one, of negative 120. There's two ways you can go about this. Um, you have omega and you have RPM. Um, I'm giving you RPM and I'm asking you for RPM. The question here is what is the, um, this is initial, what is RPM final of the whole system? They will rotate together, right? So what is RPM final of the whole system? I'm giving you an RPM, I'm asking for an RPM, but remember the momentum equation, the angular momentum equation has omega and not RPM. So you have two choices. You can convert from RPM um, you can go from RPM to Omega, do your calculations, and then come back to RPM, or you can just rewrite the, um, the angular momentum equation, the L equation, um, in terms of RPM instead of Omega. I'm gonna do that instead because I wanna show you how that would look, okay? So, conservation of angular momentum, you're doing something that changes the rotation of a system, so we're gonna start with Li equals LF, okay? In the beginning, all you have is you have the blue disc spinning by itself um, and the, the gray disc doesn't spin at all. So all I have is I1 omega 1 initial. At the end, they're going to spin together. They both have rotation, so I'm gonna have I2. Um, if you want, you could have written it this way, right? I2 omega 2 initial and just say that this is zero because that disc is at rest, okay? And then this is gonna be I1 omega 1 final plus I2 omega 2 final. I hope you realize that this is going to be the same, okay? Omega 1 final equals omega 2 final, so we're just gonna call it omega final because they are, um, they're going to spin together as a result, okay? You may even remember that these situations where two objects collide and after the collision they move with the same speed is called uh, a completely inelastic collision. So this is technically a completely inelastic angular collision. Cool? Fascinating. All right, so we're gonna be able to do this here, omega final, I1 plus I2. Um, and this here is just I1 omega one uh, initial. And then what I wanna do, we don't have omegas, we have, um, we have RPMs, so I wanna rewrite omegas in terms of RPM. So I1, instead of omega, I'm gonna have two pi RPM one initial divided by 60 equals um, two pi RPM 
final divided by 60, and that is times I1 plus I2, okay? I'm gonna cancel two pi's, I'm gonna cancel the 60's, and you end up with this. I'm giving you that this is 120, and I'm asking you for this. All you gotta do now is plug in I1 and I2. So let's do that real quick. So I'm gonna go off to the side here and find I1. Um, I1 is half M1 R1 squared, half M1 is 100, the radius is six squared, and if you do this, um, you get 1800. For I2, you have half M2 R2 squared. I'm gonna calculate these off to the side because we're gonna use these a lot. Um, this is gonna be half 50, uh, three squared, so that's, that's gonna be 225. Okay, yep, 225. All right, so let's plug these numbers back in here. I1 is gonna be um, 1800 times the initial RPM. The initial RPM is this one right here of the first disc. It's negative 120 um, equals RPM final, which is our target variable. And then we're gonna add the two I's. So 1800 plus 225. I combine this, I move it over to the other side and I get that the final RPM of the joint system is going to be negative 107, negative 107. Now, this should make sense. The disc was spinning with 120. Once you added something to the top of the disc, it now slows down a little bit, goes from 120 to 107, still spins in the same direction, which is the negative direction. So the final RPM is 107, um, I guess we should say here clockwise. Um, now, that's part A. Uh, where the disc that we put, the smaller gray disc, had no initial speed. Now for part B, that disc will have initial speed, and we're tight on space here, but I'm gonna cram it in here, and we're gonna be fine. So for part B, um, same equation, I1 omega one initial plus I2 omega two initial equals I1 omega one final plus I2 omega two final. Remember, I can rewrite omega as 2 pi RPM over 60. Okay, that's what we did here. So I'm gonna rewrite all of these omegas as 2 pi RPM over 60. So I'm gonna have every single one of these four terms will have a 2 pi and a 60. So I can cancel the 2 pi and 60 on all of them. Essentially, I'm replacing W just with RPM because 2 pi and 60 will cancel everywhere. I1 is the same here, 1800, so I'm gonna write 1800 RPM one initial plus um, 225 RPM two initial equals, the omega here is the same because they spin together, and then I just add up, um, and I'm also gonna rewrite this as RPM uh, as well, so RPM final of both, this is our target variable, and I'm gonna add up the I's, so it's gonna be 1800 plus 225, okay? The RPM of the first one in this problem, um, the, the bigger disc rotates with 120 clockwise, so this is gonna be negative 120, and it's saying here that the second disc for part B would be spinning counterclockwise, so positive, with an RPM of 360. So here, this would be plus 360. Okay, so if you multiply all this crap on the left, um, you get a big negative number, a smaller positive number, and if you combine those, the left side combines to be negative 135,000, um, and the right side is 2025. So RPM final times 2025. So I'm gonna move the 2025 to the other side and divide the two and we get to the final answer which is negative 67 so the final rpm is negative 67 this means that it's also clockwise let's talk about this real quick what this means is so this is the second answer here for part b um, very similar setup to part a just the, the only thing that changed was this um, here that instead of zero was 360 okay so it, it let's talk about this real quick it was spinning at 120 if you added a disc that isn't, doesn't spin at all, it just makes it heavier, so it's gonna go from 120 to 107, but if instead you get a disc that's spinning in the other direction, right? So one disc spinning uh, 
clockwise and then you add a disc that is counterclockwise, um, the final of the two will be lower. And that's because the bigger disc has to slow down a lot to cancel out the opposite rotation of the other objects, all right? So this, uh, hopefully this makes sense, but let me know if you have any questions and let's keep going.